Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Shafiq, and I would like to welcome all of you in this video session. Today, we'll be talking about uh, the rest of the part of the shear strength of soil. Okay, we already finished most of them, but today I'll discuss some of the advanced stuff that you might need for your uh, slope stability analysis. Okay. So here you can see this is the Mohr Coulomb diagram for triaxial test. This is your Mohr circles, and then this is your Coulomb, Mohr Coulomb failure surface, right? So this one is for UU test. You can see they have like similar size, you know, like circles here. This is for uh, more circle for CU test, okay, without pore pressure data. So you didn't sub subtract the pore water pressure data from there. This one is your CU test. So basically you subtracted the pore water pressure. So you can see this circles are moving a little bit left, uh, which is basically equal to the uh, pore water pressure that developed at failure, right? Now, there are several things I have to discuss here. First of all, you can see the first one here when your sigma three equal to zero, that's basically your unconfined compression test. So you can see we are trying to show that one with UU test because your unconfined compression test is a kind of um, UU test, right? But you can see this uh, circle is a little bit smaller than the other two circles, which is actually that UU test, actually UU test. So why this circle is a little smaller? Most of the time, your circle would be a little bit smaller because your, <clears throat> excuse me, because your, uh, specimen is not completely saturated for unconfined compression test. On the other hand, that's a requirement for the UU test to make that one completely saturated. So if your soil is not completely saturated, then basically um, you might see a little different size, you know, like a, a circle, more circle for, uh, unconfined compression test. Now, you can see here also the diameter of that circle, like sigma one minus sigma three, that's basically the deviator stress, right? Deviator stress is sigma one minus sigma three. So your circle diameter is always equal to the deviator stress. Now, you, you test that deviator stress doesn't change if you change your sigma three, why? Because uh, when you run that you, you test, you remember that you don't allow the soil to drain at all. If it doesn't drain, this means like actually the soil is not consolidating, okay? And the other thing, when you apply the total pore, pore water pressure, or cell pressure, then basically all the excess pore water pressure will be taken by uh, water. So this one is not changing the effective stress in the soil. So the soil is not changing at all. If the soil doesn't change because of the load you apply, then basically your deviator stress will not change. Okay, that's why you get equals size circle in the UU test. Now, if you go to CU test, then basically at the beginning, you apply the cell pressure and then you allow the soil to consolidate it, right? And at the end, when your pore water pressure is zero, this means like that any, uh, any excess pore water pressure becomes zero and all the load that what you applied actually applied to the soil. And that would change the 
soil fabric and that would be more compacted like if we apply higher sigma 3. That's why you see like when we apply higher sigma 3 here compared to this one, then your soil is more consolidated. That's why this one will show more strength, okay? So basically the strength of soil is highly dependent on um, your compaction, that how compacted, how consolidated is your soil is. And you can remember also that if the soil, soil is not, you know, like consolidated or normally consolidated soil, even for clay, the uh, cohesion is zero. Means like that doesn't show any strength because that's the loosest condition that soil can have. Now, as soon as you compact the soil, actually your uh, soil strength will increase. If we apply more sigma three, the soil will be more compacted and the soil will be, uh, will show higher, you know, deviator stress. And that's why you see these circles are getting bigger and bigger. Okay, this one will be even bigger here. That's the same thing for CD test. Actually, this one is also applied for CD test because if you take the pore water pressure out, that's actually represents, represents the CD test here, okay? Now you can also see this is the pre-consolidation pressure here, approximate pre-consolidation pressure. So after that pre-consolidation pressure, any pressure you apply, that basically becomes a normally consolidated soil because your pressure is now higher than the pre-consolidation pressure. So this one looks like go like through the origin because for unconsolidated, normally consolidated soil, this one is here. For over consolidated soil, actually you can see this one is going like something like this, okay? Now, when we draw the um, track CL test, you know, like more circle, then basically what we know from the test, first of all, we know sigma three, and then we also know the deviator stress. So if I add deviator stress with sigma three, then basically I get my sigma one. So that we know the three things here, sigma one, sigma three, and the deviator stress. So what we do usually like put that number here, put that number, then we make a circle here, and then we try to draw the tangent here so that it just touches like one single point here. And once I draw that one, then I can say, hey, this is my failure plane. This is my failure plane. This is my failure plane here, okay, for three different cases. So sometimes we see that um, more Coulomb diagrams are kind of tedious to plot for variety of reasons. What are, what are those reasons? First of all, circle are dif difficult to draw, especially to obtain suitable dark lines to reproduce because you have to draw three, four different circles for three different tests. And when many circles are plotted on the same diagram, the maze of lines obscure the results, okay? For clarity, it's not that good. And then it's also inconvenient to try to use the statical technique to obtain the best fit failure in block because you have several, you know, like all the time, let's get back here. It may not be like such a way that actually you are gonna get a line here and then exactly a line here. You might have like some of the, you know, I might have to adjust a little bit there. And we adjust that one based on best fit curve. And here actually it's kind of difficult to fit that curve. So rather than using that uh, more subtle, we sometimes we modify that one a little bit and that's called the uh, modified more Coulomb diagram, which I'm gonna show in the next page. But you can see how we do that one that's basically the same thing here. You already familiar with that thing. And 
if I rearrange this equation here, like sine phi equal to BC divided by AB, and try to rearrange that equation, then I can write that one is equal to half sigma one minus sigma three equal to half sigma one plus sigma three sine phi plus C cosine phi. Now you can see this is basically a equation for a straight line. If I assume this is my X, this is my M, this is Y. Actually, we are assuming here, this is like P, which is half sigma one plus sigma three. And this is your Q. So Q equal to P tan theta plus C. So let me show that one here that in that equation, I'm assuming sigma one plus sigma three by two is equal to P, sigma one minus sigma three divided by two equal to Q, tan delta equal to sine phi, and D equal to C cosine phi, then my equation becomes like this, Q equal to P tan delta plus D. D is the intercept here, delta is the angle here, angle with the horizontal of that line. Now you can see here that I try to plot that one here. This is my P, this is my Q. And for if I know my P and Q for two, three different tests, I can just plug that one here and draw the line, best fit curve. Even though here the, all the lines are at the same line, it may not be like this in actual case, they might like a little bit off from there. So you have to draw the best fit curve with that. And then you can say, hey, this is basically my failure plane, okay? So that's the way you can, you can show that one rather than using like more circle because it's much cleaner and um, easier to develop. Okay, you don't have to draw any circle here. You don't have to draw any tangent. Drawing tangent is sometimes very difficult because you have to make sure that this one is just creating, uh, touching one point at a time. Uh, so that's basically our, sometimes we call that one PQ diagram. Okay, now there are several observations you can get from this diagram. First of all, when P equal to zero, your delta equal to zero, right? Because sine phi equal to zero. So tan phi, tan zero, tan inverse zero is actually zero. So the failure envelope is horizontal, just like the conventional Mohr circle diagram for EU test, okay? So that becomes EU test when this one is flat, no angle. And then when your C equal to zero, then you can also see that C equal to zero means like D is also zero. So this one is gonna go through the origin, okay? And the two diagrams are thus very similar visually. It's just that the PQ diagram element eliminates the circle and tangents reducing uh, each case to a single point, okay? To a single point like that. So, you might need that one. The other thing is like, uh, uh, you can see actually P, sometimes we call the, uh, the average stress, okay? Sigma one plus sigma three divided by two. And Q, we call that one sometimes, you know, like uh, the deviator stress, half of the deviator stress actually, okay? But so in the next case, you can see, that you can also change your PQ diagram more because we are gonna use this PQ diagram for um, one of our solutions, okay? For stability analysis. So we need to learn that one now because we have to use that one. So you can see here that you can rearrange that equation and you can write that one like, sigma one minus sigma three is equal to this plus this. 
So this one has sigma three here. So if I ask you, simplify that one in such a way that this part two C cosine phi plus one minus sine phi means like this part is, is here D prime, okay? And this part is basically your tan psi prime, and this is sigma three, and this is sigma, sigma one minus sigma three, that's actually your y, okay? Then this one becomes sigma y minus, sigma one minus sigma three is equal to sigma three tan psi phi plus d prime, okay? So this one is basically sigma three versus sigma one minus sigma three. Then this is your d prime and the angle here, you can just calculate that one from this equation here, okay? So what this one is actually look like, you can see this is your consolidation pressure versus your, actually this one is your deviator stress, right? So consolidation stress or confining stress versus deviator stress, okay? So once you get these values, you can just put that one here, here, and you can just draw that line and find out your D prime or calculate that one directly from this equation here. Now let's move forward. There is another way. This is like your alternative PQ diagram one. Then we have another one is called the alternative PQ diagram two. Okay, how we can do that one? You can see, I just tried to show that one here, the same equation. And if you just play a little bit with this equation, you can just show that one as sigma one is equal to two C cosine phi, one minus sine phi plus sigma three one plus sine phi divided by one minus sine phi. So you can see here, if you see this is your sigma three and six is actually X, and this is sigma one equal to your uh, Y, then basically you can just plot that one, then basically your D prime would be equal to this, and you can find out which is basically this one here, and your tan psi prime would be one plus sine phi divided by one minus sine phi. So tan, um, or psi prime is tan inverse of this thing here. Okay, this is a plot of sigma three versus sigma one. You can directly, if you just when run the test, you can have like your sigma three and sigma one, you can just put like for each of the test, like a point here, point here, point here, and draw that line here. And you can find out this one graphically that what would be your intercept and what would be your psi prime here. Okay, now let's see an example, okay? So this one is saying, consider the example of a drain triaxial test in clay with the following two data points, okay? So you ran two different triaxial tests. But the first test, you got your sigma three equal to 70 and sigma one is 200 kPa. For the second test, you got your sigma three equal to 160 kPa and your sigma one is 380, 3.5 kPa. So for normal case, if you want to show that one, like your uh, failure plane, then basically what you have to do is draw the more circle there and then draw the line. So since we are saying like it's a little bit difficult, so we are asking determine the friction angle and cohesion using the PQ diagram and modified PQ diagram. Actually, I did here only the PQ diagram here, and I ask you to do the modified PQ diagram uh, in your homework, okay? So I'll show you one of them, and then you can do definitely the other two very easily. So what we see like that, that my P1 is equal to for the first test, this is for first test, okay? And this is for second test. This is my first test, this is my second test. So your P1 is sigma one plus sigma three by two. 
So 200 plus 70 divided by two, so which is 135. And for P2 for the second test is sigma one plus sigma three by two. So 383 divided plus 160 divided by two, that's 271.75. Similarly, my Q1 is sigma one minus sigma three by two, which is 65. And Q is equal to, uh, Q2 is equal to sigma one minus sigma three by two, which is basically 111.75. Now, like this part, I just did that one, like theoretically, but actually I have now two points here one is P1, Q1, the other two is P2, Q2, right? That's the two points here. So this is actually the uh, P1, Q1, that's the point here, just like here, the other point is here, okay? So even though I'm, try I'm showing that one like the theoretical method, but actually I plotted that one here, okay? Here is one point, here is another point. And then I draw the average curve and I got this equation from there that Q is equal to 0.342P plus 18.86. So you can see this is basically your D and this angle 18.9, that's actually your delta here, okay? So that basically this is it. So if you get any other test, then this one has to be along that line here. The same, you know, like for same soil, right? Whatever is your sigma three, your sigma one is gonna change and you will see this one is along that line here, okay? Now you can do the same thing using your uh, other modified PQ diagram. You can find out like if you just go back here, let's say here. So if, if you know your sigma three and your sigma one minus sigma three, then try to see like, hey, what are the two points there for two, three different tests? And if you draw this line here, then this one would be your D prime and this angle would be your psi prime, okay? So that's give you the freedom to draw your uh, failure surface at different setting. One is actually your PQ diagram, which is average uh, versus your um, uh, deviator stress. The other one here, this one is basically your sigma three versus um, your deviator stress, means like your uh, confining a stress, and then this is basically your deviator stress, right? And then the other one, you can just do that one directly like sigma three and sigma one, okay? Two principal stresses here. If you have any question, please don't hesitate to uh, join me in the Zoom session so that I can show that one little better. Now let's move forward. We also need to know the factors affecting the shear strength, okay? Because you have to find out the shear strength of the soil uh, of the foundation while you are gonna make your embankment or slope, okay? So these are the three factors might have some significant, you know, like uh, impact on the uh, shear strength. I'm not saying that every time this one will show, you know, the effect, but uh, there might be. First of all, the disturbance during sampling, transport, and testing. Uh, second thing is anisotropy, okay, whether the soil show equal isotropic means like when the property is same in every direction, okay. And isotropy means like when the strength of soil could be different at a different direction. And that can happen like when, depend on what kind of particles you are talking about. If the soils are kind of like flaky particles, then they might have different, you know, like strength when you apply the 
sigma one this way or the sigma one this way, okay? And then the creep strength loss or the strain rate effect that you are applying that load very slowly or very fast, that's your strain rate effect. And for a strain rate effect, if you do that one very slowly, then basically the load is there for a long period of time, which is, we call that one creep strength, okay? So we have to see that one because uh, your, this might be related with the long-term performance of your slope, okay? Now I'm just trying to show you some of the examples here. Uh, first of all, you can see if you take that this is the QU uh, from your block samples, okay? Block samples are basically the highest quality undisturbed soil sample. These samples are big enough to minimize the disturbance at the boundary, okay? So this is like a much bigger size. You can see this is like almost 10 inch. Um, you know, diameter, and this is like, uh, this is actually 10 inch, this is actually 10 inch, this is actually uh, 14 inch height, okay? So much bigger size. And you can see you just cut, you just rotate that one very fast. So you are just cutting that one and just putting that one inside. So there might be some disturbance at the, you know, like at the periphery, but when you think about the area ratio of that sample, that's actually very, very small. So the disturbance is very low. So in that situation, we are just comparing that one with the other way when you collect that one. This is just remolded sample, and this one is like the square one, and the round one is basically a Shelby cube sample, okay? So what you see, they just you know, like standardize that one with the block sample. And you can see actually the Shelby tube sample showed, shows only 70% of the strength obtained by the block strength. Similarly, when you remold that one, mean like you just collect the uh, disturb sample and remold your, you know, like uh, uh, your soil based on like what, you know, like uh, compaction you had, then basically you will see much lower strength here because of the setting of the particles, okay? Which is, you can see only you get 35% of the strength that you get from your block sample, okay? But this is not like, that dramatic for many soils. So if you have any confusion, definitely you have to take a look or you have to collect sample like Shelby tube sample and remolded sample and try to see that how much is the difference. Actually collecting block samples is very difficult because it's much bigger size and then running the test uh, is not that common, you know, like for uh, most of the lab. Actually, this one is only done for a research purpose. And some of the you know, research facilities might have that kind of, or they can just build that kind of instrument to get block samples. But basically running the test is too difficult using the conventional uh, test equipment. So we usually don't do that one, but definitely we can just do that one with Shelby tube sample and remolded sample and see that, hey, how much is the difference there, okay? The effect of anisotropy, you know, like you can see here that this is your, this is the slope here and this is the failure plane, okay? So you can see actually the failure occur at different surfaces here, right? Now they are using the beta, this is like 90 degree, beta is the angle with the horizontal, or how you are applying that deviator stress, okay? Here, this one is 30 degree here, this one should be zero here, actually they made a mistake. That should be zero here, okay? 
Now you can see here when this one is 90 or when this one is zero, but these two soils actually didn't change that much. They are kind of very similar. Okay, what are those two soils? This is like Atchafalaya clay, and, and this is basically Atchafalaya is a uh, lake in Louisiana, and there is a big dam over there. And this is San, San Francisco Bay mud. Okay. So you can see for mud and clay, basically this one didn't affect that much. But when we are talking about shell, this two is shell, then you can see that this strength can change significantly, okay? Significantly and it has the lowest around like 30 to 45 degrees, okay? So you have to make sure if you are using any kind of shell material there, then basically isotropy um, or an isotropy might be a important factor. If you use clay, then basically it may not be that important. Now, here we also show the different thing here, like this is like your compression test, like when you apply that, you know, shear as a compression, this is just simple shear test, simple direct shear test, okay? Like the, you put that one in the shear box and try to shear this way, okay? And this is called the extension test that you are just trying to apply tension to separate like two part of that thing. Now, if you do that three test here, this is from Zeram and Lad, you can see here, that this is kind of like shear strength, which is uh, normalized with the TC, means like crack cell compression test. So that's why this one is very, you know, like uniform along the line one here. But if you do other tests, direct simple shear test or like crack cell extension test, that actually your strength is much lower like one, this is your DSS test and this is your extension test. Extension test actually shows the lowest strength there, okay? We are not gonna do that one in the field because that extension test or direct simple shear test, these are not that common, okay? The other thing is most of the lab, commercial lab doesn't have that traxial extension test facility there. But this one is just to inform you that like if you do other kind of test, then basically your shear strength would be much lower. Now, actually Casagrande and Carrillo proposed the following relationship for the directional variation of undrained shear strength. He is saying that at any angle, here is your angle alpha. This is sigma one and this is sigma three. So at any angle that would be Cu alpha equal to zero plus Cu alpha 90 minus Cu alpha zero sine square alpha, okay? For normally consolidated clay, Cu alpha 90 is always greater than zero, okay? So you can see this is a normally consolidated anisotropic clay. So this is your Cu alpha equal to zero, and this is Cu alpha equal to 90. So alpha 90 is bigger than alpha zero here, normally consolidated clay. This is the isotropic clay, means like sigma zero is equal to sigma 90, okay? Sigma zero equal to sigma 90. And then you have like over consolidated soil for over consolidated clay, you can see your sigma alpha equal to zero is actually bigger than alpha equal to 90. Now, we are talking a lot about that, but I'll just say that we don't need to see that one, let's say for an highway embankment, which is let's say 15, 20 feet high, okay? We don't have to be that sensitive. But when we are talking about a are the dam, which is maybe like 300 feet, 400 feet height, okay? And which is very, very expensive to construct. 
So in that situation, actually, we have to take a look of, of all these important factors like anisotropy, like, and uh, uh, the other thing what we are, I'm discussing now, okay? So this discussion of what we are doing in this video, this is basically very, very sensitive only for structures where the height of the embankment or height of the slope is significant, okay? More than 100, you know, like feet, I would say, okay? So basically we are trying to show that one, the same thing for Winni Winnipeg upper brown clay. And you can see this is for 90 degree, alpha equal to 90 degree, which is basically the normal one, what we do. And this is for zero degrees. So we can see actually around like 45, 40 alpha. Then basically we see the lowest strength, okay? Now, effect of creep. First of all, creep is basically significant strength loss occur in saturated clay due to sustained loading, okay? Long-term loading. So you are just doing your test very slowly and the weight is sitting there for a long time. So in that situation, we get like a strength like that. Okay, so this is your compressive strength. And this is time to failure. So if you take enough time, okay, from here to here, it's almost like more than a week, like two weeks time, then we see that we see lower strength. Okay, so in the lab, we usually do the EVU test like 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, for CD test, maybe like four hours and CU test maybe two to three hours. Unconfined test is 15 to 20 minutes, okay? But actual field, you can understand the load, you know, like is applied extremely small rate. So we are just trying to see that whether there has any if impact of that in our design. So you can see slower strain causes lower undrained strength. So this is our slower one, okay, for a long time. And this is the first one, the circle here. So this one is actually higher than this strength, right? So you can see this is creep test, entire load applied at a long, at once. And then I'm just trying my, you know, like strain extremely slowly. So you can see more than this is one hour to one day and this is one week. So this one here is almost like two weeks time period that if you run the test for two weeks time period, then actually you get lower strength. And then it remains kind of same. They didn't plot that one, but they actually did that test even longer than that. And they saw that actually the strength is not decreasing anymore, okay? So, that's, you have to understand that one, that your actual strength in the field could be much smaller because the strain rate is very slowly and the load is there for a prolonged period of time. Just think about the lifetime of a earth dam. It could be hundred years, right? So it's just moving actually extreme slowly or also Think about the construction period might, might be three, four years, okay? So that's kind of important here. Now the long-term strength of clay. We test the soil kind of short term, but what happened in the long term, especially for clay, because clay has negative charge and they try to, you know, attract water and try to, you know, swell a little bit, okay? Depends on what kind of soil you are saying. If it's kaolinite, then it doesn't swell at that much, but if it is, there is any more morilonite clay, they will try to attract water and try to swell, right? So any high plasticity soil or any kind of clay material is, could be, you know, like over the years, then that can, change its strength. So long-term shear strength 
of natural clay in the field are lower than brain shear strength measured in the laboratory. That's because of the reason, right? The clay soil, they try to absorb a little bit more water over time. What is that time frame? Maybe like five years, 10 years. They just try to get a little bit more water. When they get more water, actually, they will have lower strength, okay? So current understanding is that the water content of the clay increases as the clay softens. More over a period of years or decades in the field than it does over a period of hours or days in the laboratory. So higher the water content, the lower is the shear strength. So when it's trying to absorb a little bit more water and get softened, then basically the particle would be less dense they will try to move a little bit away from there. And that will cause actually lower strength. So there may also be a strength reduction due to smaller strength rates in the field. That's what I said earlier. Okay, the actual field your strain is very slow. So you can get a little bit less strength there. It may also be true that negative excess pore water pressure actually dissipates much more slowly than usually we think, okay? It might take much more time uh, actual in the actual field, okay? So these are the reasons that you have to understand that the long-term strength of clay might be a little less uh, in the actual field uh, than what we measure in the lab uh, because we cannot you know, like simulate the long-term, you know, effect in the laboratory because we do that one very fast in the laboratory, okay? Now, why this question is coming? Because we see that most of the, you know, like art dams, which was constructed in 1930s to 40s, and some of them broke down, let's say, in 1980, 85, or 90. So we got the chance to back calculate and see like, hey, what the you know, uh, lab strength we got. And then we tried to find out actually what is the current you know, like strength the soil have. And then we realized that after 50 years, actually the strength of the clay has lowered than what we got in the lab. So based on that understanding, like several cases now we see that actually the long-term effect or long-term strength of clay could be a little bit lower than what we get in the laboratory, okay? So this is like fully softened clay, okay? So what happens like for a very long period of time, they just try to, you know, like move a little bit. So this is your undisturbed peak when you do that one, you know, like in the lab, but actually over the period of time, this one fully softens and then basically you get a strength much lower than here, okay? And over the time, you will see that when displacement occurs here significantly, then we get the residual strength, okay? So if you see that sigma versus tau, then basically you can see this is the uh, undisturbed peak means like what you did in the lab. And then after long term, this one you get like this. And once this one fails, then basically you get this one, which is actually called the residual strength. We'll talk about that in the you know, next part. Now we can see here that this is actually a PQ diagram for intact strength and love and fully softened. So this is a long-term, you know, like strength after the dam was constructed, okay? This is the one we, uh, they did, you know, in the lab before the construction, okay? So you can see there are several different, you know, type notations here. These are undisturbed vertical undisturbed, horizontal undisturbed, vertical undisturbed, horizontal, this is a uh, drained test, this is uh, CU test, okay? 
and this is undrained test. So you did all three kinds of tests for the soil and this is actually the line here. But after a long period of time, when we saw that the stability of the slope is compromised and it's moving slowly, then basically they collected the soil sample and then fully softened soil. This is undrained, you know, drained fully softened and drained peak. This is drained peak. This is CU test and this is undrained uh, test. And this one is along that line. So basically you can see the strength has changed significantly right from here to here, from here to here. So this is not exactly that, but this is basically the half of the deviator stress, okay? So here I, my deviator stress was like this multiplied by two. Here is like this multiplied by two. So actually the significant difference in time. Now you, you can also see like that this is the London clay, and then this is normally consolidated from slurry, okay? The normally consolidated soil means that which is actually the loosest condition, right? And how do you make that one in the lab? Basically, we make like a soil uh, slurry and then allow that one to settle. And they will settle very slowly, you know, because of their cell point, and then that, water will be drained, you know, very, very slowly. So you will see that the bottom, you will just create a, a very soft layer and which is very, very, you know, that kind of like loose condition. That's basically what we are trying to do. And then we also collected soil from the, that field. And then we tried to do that one. And then we see that actually they had the same line here so C equal to zero phi prime is 20 degrees here, which means like that's for fully softened clay, you don't need to find out like the actual undisturbed soil. You can just get the, um, the disturbed sample and then it is remold that one as normally consolidated soil and then try to find out the strength of that one and then you can see hey this one would be the long term strength of the clay soil okay now so fully soft and drain strength is equal to the normally consolidated and drain strength now residual shear strength residual shear strength is like when this one, the soil, the long-term effect, the soil has moved significantly. So this one is like 10 inches or more. Then what occurs is that the slip surface becomes polished and because of the plate-shaped clay particles become aligned with the sliding surface, okay? These polished surfaces are called slick and sides. Okay, once the, the slicken sites, you know, develop, then basically that time the soil has the even lower strength than the softened shear strength, which is called the residual shear strength. Okay, as I showed here earlier, that this is your fully softened peak and this is your residual strength. Residual strength occurs when this sleeping here, the slick and sides miss like a significant displacement that will occur, you know, like that soil particles, plate-like particles like aligned with this, you know, like surface, okay? And then basically this one has the lowest strength. So that's called the residual strength. So that's basically the residual strength of London clay from laboratory test and from the back, back analysis of the slides in field. Skempton did that one in 1985. And he saw that actually like, if he does the same, you know, like 
that's from the laboratory test, like this open circle, and this one is from the back, back analysis, okay? So your residual strength is only 12 degrees here, which was 20 degrees for soft end clay. This one is also showing something like similar to that, like from the back end analysis from the, um, from the stability, you know, like analysis, and you can you can see that um, this is kind of very similar to what similar trend that what we saw in the past. So good news: undisturbed samples are not needed to measure the fully sustained or residual shear strength. You can just collect the disturbed soil sample, remold that one. Uh, like normally consolidated their soil without any compaction or anything like that and run that one in your laboratory for a strength test and the strength would be your final strength means like long-term strength you know like for fully softened or residual soil strength this strength can be measured usually demolded sample because they are independent of the stress history Fully subtend and residual shear strain can be estimated quite accurately based on at work limits, clay fraction, and uh, effective stress because they are independent of the stress history. There are several, you know, like uh, correlation curves are available in the literature that you can use that one and um, try to estimate your residual shear strength based on the at our work limits or clay fraction or um, your effective stress, okay? Stiff fissured clay. Some stiff clay contains fissure, means like cracks, long cracks there, okay? These clays have been the source of many stability problems because shear strain measured in the laboratory test do not seem to apply the field condition. And they are bigger, you know, like longer, you know, like cracks. So when you take a small sample, sometimes the sample doesn't contain that fissure at all. So they usually try to show higher, you know, like strength in the lab and actual field has much lower strength because you didn't consider the fissure uh, when you did the test. Right, so field shear strength are smaller than laboratory test. The nature and the scale of fissure decreases with depth. Actually, all that fissures that develop because of the uh, high plasticity clay. You know, when this one try to shrink, then basically there will be a lot of cracks there, tension cracks. Right, so we learned that one like from the experience that when we try to calculate the stability, then we see that the like, stability is more than 1.5, but actually in the field, we saw that the dam is failing. So they tried to collect the sample again, and they saw like, hey, we are getting the same strain, then what's happening? And then they tried like other ways and they, they realized that actually there are some lot of, you know, fissures in that, that you know, like present inside the stiff clay. And then from there, like Thorne 1984, he proposed that one that this is intact soil, subs soil, and then this is non-polished fissure. Okay, some cracks here, this is slick inside fissure. Okay, this is the lowest one when slick inside means like the residual strength actually after failing the soil, okay? And this is the polished fissure. So if you have a lot of like cracks inside the soil, then basically your strength is much lower than the intact soil substance. So Mars land is also showing the same thing here. This is basically diameter of the specimen divided by specimen of the fissure. So, if your diameter is um, of the specimen gets bigger, then basically you get the lowest value, right? Lowest value. 
if you if your diameter of a specimen divided by the specimen this is like much here let's say like 0.33 then basically after that less than 0.33 we see that actual lab test would be much higher than the actual field this is like kind of actual field here okay because this is the strength measured in laboratory divided by the strength measured from the in situ test so when this one is one then basically this is actually intact soil okay so if your specimen of the fissure is like more than four inch and you are taking like three inch sample then basically the sample will not show any fissure there right i'm talking about the statistical cases So these are the things you have to consider like when you are doing for a big, big project, okay? So for normal, as I said earlier, I'm saying again for normal highway, highway um, embankment or slope, you don't need that one because their maximum height could be 15, 20 feet. And they don't have like other complexities like the water in one side, the other side is doesn't have water. So there is no seepage there. So very simple case. You don't need to consider any of those things. But if you are talking about a bigger project where the slope is height of the slope is maybe like more than 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet in that situation, actually, we must have to consider all those things. Okay and try to be in the positive side and you know, like conservative side in your design calculation so that your design or your project doesn't fail in the long term okay thank you for your attention and if you have any question once again please don't hesitate to join the zoom session that what i do twice every week Okay, thank you so much.